welcome to this predicted paper from OnMaths that is based on the advanced information given to us by the exam boards. Please use this paper in addition to your other revision. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMaths site. OnMaths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams such as topic based papers, demon questions and mini mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing. There are 10 squares in total, so each square is worth 1 tenth. And if we count all of the shaded squares, we notice that in total there are 7 shaded squares. So that's 7 lots of 1 tenth, or 7 tenths. Here we're given two angles on a straight line, and we know that all angles add up to 180 on a straight line. So to find out what A is, we're going to do 180 take away 95. 180 take away 95 is going to be 85 degrees. So angle A is 85 degrees, and the reason is that angles on a straight line add to 180 degrees. And try and get used to writing down the reason as well, because there are quite a lot of marks for the reasons. So a prime number is a number that is only in the one times table and its own times table. So 4, for example, is not a prime number because it is also in the two times table. 6 is in the two times table. 15 is in the three times table. 21 is also in the three times table. 9 is also in the three times table. Now 1 is a bit of a special case. The definition is that it has to be in one and its own times table, and technically one is only in one of those. So one is not a prime number. The smallest prime number is actually two, but two is not in this list. 23, though, is not in any other times table, so 23 is a prime number. So we're going to use a function machine to find out the output when we've got an input of 11. So we put 11 into this machine. And the first thing that happens is we multiply it by 3. So out of that first machine, we're going to have 33, which is 11 times 3. Then the next part of the machine is going to take away 5 from that. So 33 take away 5 is going to be 28. So our output is going to be 28. If we try to draw a quadrilateral with a pair of parallel sides, and then it's a quadrilateral, so join them up, it's got four sides. Then the shape we draw will always be a trapezium. So our answer is that it is a trapezium. Now you might think that a rectangle and square do does have one pair of parallel sides, but it actually has two pairs of parallel sides. The definition of a trapezium is it has just one pair of parallel sides, and any quadrilateral that has one pair of parallel sides is a trapezium. In this question we're given the output as 53, so we know that the output was 53. So now we've kind of got to work backwards, and when we work backwards through a function machine or a number machine, we do the opposite of what it says. So this first one says plus 9, but when we go backwards we do the opposite, which is take away 9. So we do 53 take away 9, which is 44. Now we can check that by going the other way, so 44 plus 9 is 53, so that works. The next one says times 4, so the opposite would be divided by 4. So we're going to do 44 divided by 4, and that gives us an input of 11. Now let's check the whole thing. We put in 11, 11 times 4 is 44, 44 plus 9 is 53, so we know we've got it correct. So we're just going to start by writing the number a little bit bigger. So it says to two decimal places, so we're going to draw a line after the second decimal place. Now all the numbers to the right are going to disappear, they're going to turn to zero, and because it's a decimal that just means we get rid of them. But we have to look at this number first. Now if this number is less than 5, we just keep the number to the left, so 8.17. But if it's 5 or more, then this 7 goes up to an 8. 
so this will be 8.18. To find a coordinate, what we can do is we can start in the middle and we work out how far across we have to go. And here we have to go 2 across, so the x coordinate is 2. Then we find out how far upwards or downwards we have to go. And here we can go, well, we have to go 3 downwards, so that's going to be minus 3. So we first of all look at the x coordinate, the 2, then the y coordinate, minus 3, along the corridor, up, or in this case, down the stairs. Congruent means that it's a shape that is exactly the same as another shape, but it can be rotated, translated, can be flipped around, but it's basically the same shape. So I imagine cutting it out onto cardboard and trying to fit it into the other shape. If it can fit, then they are congruent. So looking at the shapes, we've got some triangles, we've got some um, weird looking shapes, but I'm going to look at A and I'm going to draw A in. I'm just going to trace A. And what we can notice is if I manipulate that now, and if I bring it down to E, it kind of almost looks the same as E, but what I can do is actually just reflect it, and it's exactly the same as E. So A and E are congruent. I'm going to start just by writing down the number. And we're asked to round this to three significant figures. And that basically what that means is starting from the left hand side, it's three numbers that we want. So one, two, three. And we're going to do our line after that third number. And you start counting the first non zero digits. So the first digit there was two, so we started counting. Now all the numbers to the left, or sorry, to the right, so these numbers here, will all turn to zero. But before that happens, we look at this number. Now this number, if it's five or more, it moves this number up by one. If it's less than five, that number stays the same. Now it is five or more, because it is five, so it's not going to be 207, it's going to be 208. Now a common mistake is that students write down 208. No. All the numbers to the right of that line turn to zero. So it would be zero, zero, zero. So it would be 20, 000, or 208,000 exactly. In this question, we've got pounds and we've got dollars. And we're told that one pound is equivalent to 2.12 dollars. And we're asked how many dollars can be bought for 1,500 pounds. So to get from 1 to 1,500, we times by 1,500, and we just go do the same to the other side, 1,500, and when we do that, we get the answer of 3,180. So 1,500 pounds is equivalent to 3,180 dollars. So we've just got to go around this two-way table, filling in what we can. Um, so if we look here, the uh, total amount completely is 25, so it's 25 students, and the total who said yes is 17. So if we take the 17 away from the 25, that leaves us 8. So 8 must have said no. Then same thing with here. Um, there are um, 17 in total who said yes, 12 picked salad, and so therefore we take the 12 away from the 17 and we get 5. And so the total for the pizza is, will be 6. And then 6 plus 19 is 25. So we've got this bit along here. And then 12 plus 7 is 19. And we can check that as well. 1 plus 7 equals 8. So we know we've got it right. So what we do is we notice that um, to get this 10, we add the 3 and the 7. To get this 17... We add the 7 and the 10. And to get this 27, we add the 10 and the 17. Whenever we have this kind of sequence, it's called a Fibonacci sequence. You essentially add the previous two terms to get to the next term. And so what we need to do is just simply add the 17 and the 27. When you do that, you get 44. So our next term is 44. 
I'm going to start by just labeling the missing angles on each of the triangles. So we've got a missing angle here, which is 40, because we're going to take away 105 and 35 from 180. And we've got a missing angle here, which is 35 degrees. Again, taking away 105 and 40 from 180. So the tempting answer is to say that G is 2 meters, because they're both at the bottom of the shape. But have a look at where 2 meters is, and have a look at where G is. G is between 35 degrees and 105 degrees. It's the length between those two angles. Well, the 2 meters is between the 105 degrees, but the 2 meters is between the 40 degrees and the 105 degrees. So if we look at this left-hand triangle and see where the 35 degrees is, it's up here. So actually the corresponding lengths are this one and this one. And because they're congruent triangles, we know that the lengths are going to be the same. The formula for the area of a triangle is half times the base times the height. Now the base is the uh, normally the length on the bottom, but that's not always the case. The important bit though is that the base and the height hit each other at 90 degrees. So this length here is not going to be the height because it hits the base at an acute angle. If we look, this here. Same with the one on the left. It's, the height is obviously going to be this length here in the middle. So let's put that into our formula. Half times the base, which is 5, times the height, which is 3. So it's going to be half times 15, and that will equal 7.5. Both the length in the diagram are centimetres, therefore the area will be centimetres squared. Mode just means the most common or most frequent, and modal is exactly the same. It's just the most frequent um, amount of coins we're looking for. So the um, students who had three coins in their pockets came up 15 times. Students had four coins in their pocket, well there were 16 of them. There were 15 students who had five coins, 17 students who had six coins, and 12 students who had seven coins. So the most frequent amount of coins a student has in their pocket will be six, because it happened 17 times, which is more than any other amount of coins. So we can quickly draw a line of best fit for here. And it looks something like that. And if our line of best fit is increasing like we have here then we say the data is positive if however the line of best fit is decreasing and looks like this we say that it's a negative correlation so positive if it's going up which this one is so it's a positive correlation and if it's going down then it's a negative correlation if um, the data is all over the place, so it looks like something like this, where you've got the points everywhere, we say that's no correlation. So to draw a line of best fit, you want to make sure that roughly there's the same amount of um, data on top of your line and below your line. Um, now, but if you think about it, this line here would also would work uh, according to that rule. Clearly, the um, line of best fit needs to go with the data. So I'm going to start it roughly here, and then just draw a line going down like that. Now, you might notice that sometimes, um, like, say if I draw that, you might notice that we've got uh, one, two, two below, maybe this one as well, three below, and then one on top. Don't worry too much if there's not a complete equal amount on top or below. Um, what we mean is, if it looks like that, that's clearly wrong because you've got um, all of the data below and obviously this one here. You want it roughly so that um, there's equal amounts at the top and bottom. But if if you have it slightly off, so slightly down here or something, um, don't rub it out. Um, it's chances are you'll get the mark. They're quite lenient when you draw lines of best fit. First thing I'm going to do to answer this question is I'm just going to quickly draw out the... Um, shape again just so I can kind of show the calculations a bit easier okay the first thing um, I'm going to do on the diagram is convert all of these lengths to centimeters so we've got 4200 
1,200, 2,400, and 1,800. And next, I'm going to convert them into what um, the scale says they're going to be in our diagram. So a scale of 1 to 600 means 600 in real life, and this diagram is showing the real life situation, is 1 on our diagram. So I've converted them all in centimetres, and now I need to work out how many centimetres there are going to be on our diagram. So I'm going to start with the 4,200, and all you need to do is divide it by 600, and I get the answer of 7. So it's going to be 7 centimetres on our diagram. 1,200 divided by 600, it's going to be 2. So that's going to be 2 centimetres on our diagram. Um, 2,400 is obviously going to be 4 centimetres. And um, 1,800 divide that by the 600, so obviously going to be 3. So that's going to be 3 centimetres. So now we know what it's going to be on our diagram, we draw it. So we're going to do 7 across, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 across there. I'm going to do 2 down. So 1, 2, 4 across. 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to do the left hand one first, I think. So we're going to do 3 down here. And then we just kind of join it up with what's left over. And that's our diagram. We're going to start off with a dot at minus 13. And it says that x can be greater than minus 13, and greater is to the right of that. And it goes on forever, so we just put a little arrow saying it goes on forever. Last thing we do is check to see whether it's hollow or a filled in dot. Well, this cannot be equal to minus 13, so it remains a hollow dot. Rate is always something over time. So in this question, we can write a quick formula of rate is volume, like released from the water bottle, over time. Now we can rearrange that so that we have, uh, because we're looking for the amount of water or the volume of the water, we can just rearrange it so that we have volume equals rate times time. Now it says the rate is 62 millilitres per second, so we've got 62 in there. The time is 11 seconds, so we just do 62 times 11, which is 682 seconds. Uh, oh, not seconds, millilitres, because it's volume. So 682 is our answer. The experimental probability... is the successful outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. So we're looking for the probability that it's white, so it's going to be 25 over, and we're just going to do 35 plus 25 plus 31, which is 91, and that's our probability, 25 over 91. Be careful, when, when it say total, you must include all of the outcomes, so red, white, and other. So we've got to, first of all, uh, make these both the same units, because at the moment, they are different units. And when we have ratios, we always want to make sure that they have the same units, and then we can get rid of the units. Um, so I'm just going to make them both into grams. I'm going to do that by times in the right by 1,000. And the reason I've chosen grams rather than kilograms is you want to always pick the smaller unit, um, otherwise you'd be left with a decimal on the left-hand side, you'd be 0 0.2, and that can be a bit more complicated. Okay, so I'm going to remove the units now, and we're just going to focus on the numbers. So we can divide both sides by 100, straight off the bat. So we've got 2 to 40, we can see we can divide them both by 2. And so we've got 1 to 20. And so it's 1 gram to 20 grams, or just 1 to 20. To answer this question, we need to cut this shape into two shapes. So we're going to draw a line across here, and we're going to cut it into a rectangle and a triangle. 
Now we need to first of all label the um, part of the triangle. So the length or the width of the triangle, the base, will be the same as the base at the bottom, so that will be 20 centimeters. And we need to find the height, which is this length here, which is 90, degree, 90 degrees to the base. And to find that, what, what we can look at is the fact that the total height of the whole thing is 13. And the bit, uh, the height of the bit we don't want is 11. So what's left over? Well, 2 centimetres will be left over. So the height will be 2 centimetres of the triangle. So let's work out the area of the triangle first. Which is going to be half times base times height half times the base which is 20 times the height which is 2 will just give us 20 now let's work out the area of the rectangle and that's just going to be the width times the length width is 20 the length is 11, so that would be 220. Then to work out the total area of the whole thing, we're just going to do, add those together. So 220 plus 20, which is 240. The units are all in centimetres, and so the area units will be centimetres squared. So we're going to track the amount of eggs to make the amount of, or to make each amount of omelette. So five eggs makes 17 omelettes. And we're just gonna find out how much is required, how many eggs is required to make one omelette. So we divide that by 17, divide both sides by 17. And so one omelette would be 0 0.294 blah 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 eggs. Next we want to see how many for 67 omelettes. And to get to 67 from 1, times 67. So do that to the amount of eggs. And we get 19.705, blah, blah, blah. Now, you can't get 0 0.705 of an egg. We always round with eggs. And we always round upwards, because if you need 19.7, 19 won't be enough. So we need to pick 20 eggs. We're going to start off by writing the numbers that the dots are at. So we've got minus 12 and we've got minus 5. And x is anywhere between those. Now, it's obviously going to be greater than minus 12. And it's going to be less than minus 5. But it can equal minus 12. And the reason for that is it's a filled in dot. But it can't equal minus 5 because that is a hollow dot. Here we're given a triangle, and we're not actually given um, the values of each of the angles. We're given them in terms of x, but we know that they're going to add up to 180. So we're going to do the 20x plus the 2x plus the 23x, and we know that it's going to equal 180. And the reason is that its angles in a triangle add up to 180. Okay, let's get our tram lines in, because we've got algebra and we're solving here going to put our tram lines in. Now on the left hand side we need to add these x terms together. So 2x plus 23x will be 25x plus the 20 will be 45x. And what we're going to do to get x on its own, we're going to divide both sides by 45. So we're going to divide by 45 both sides. And we're going to end up with x equals 4. In this question, we've got euros and we've got pounds, and we're told that uh, one pound is 2.23 euros. And we're trying to get to understand what 2,676 euros is in pounds. And we're going to do that by finding out what one euro is and then finding out how uh, much uh, 2,676 are. So, to get from uh, 2.23 to 1, we divide by 2.23 and we can do that on both sides and when we do that we get 0 0.448 blah 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 and then to get from 1 
to 2676 we are times by 2676 on both sides and when we do that we get 1200 pounds so 2676 euros is 1200 pounds so we know that the mean is the sum of numbers over the amount but in this question we're actually given what the mean is we're given that that is 29 we're also given the fact that there are four cards so we're given the amount so what we can do is just get our lines in and solve this so what we're going to do is just times both sides by four So we're going to do 29 times 4, which is 116. And so we know that the sum of the numbers will be 116. So all we need to do is to find the fourth card, is get that 116 and just take away the numbers that we know. And when we do that, we get the answer 26. Now you can easily check this by adding up 37, 26, 27 and 26 again and then dividing it by 4 and you will get 29. To find the gradient we use a simple formula which is m equals the second y coordinate take away the first y coordinate over the second x coordinate take away the first x coordinate. So our second y coordinate is 17, so it's going to be 17 take away the first one which is 14 over the second x coordinate which is 60 take away the first one which is 45. So that's going to be 3 over 15 and then cancel that down will be 1 over 5. So our gradient is 1 fifth. There's an awful lot going on in this question. Whenever there's an awful lot going on it's always best to draw a diagram. So we're going to start off at uh, Chelton, which is a C. Then we go to um, Bolko, that's where we're going. And we go through Devley on the way, so we'll do D there. Uh, distance from Chelton to Devley is 34 miles. Distance from Devley to Bovlo is 16 miles. So I'm just reading through the question, adding it to my diagram. David leaves Chelton at 9 o'clock. Um, he drives to, from Chelton to Devley an average speed of 68 miles per hour. And what speed does David travel between Devley and Bolko to arrive at 9.45? So the whole duration of this... The whole thing needs to be 45 minutes or 0.75 hours and the entire distance is uh, 34 plus 16 so that would be 50 miles. Okay now having a look at this we need to find out what time um, David was at Devley. So we're going to use our speed distance time triangle. So speed equals distance over time. And we're covering up the time because that's the one we want. So it's going to be time equals distance, which is 34, over speed, which is 68. So we're going to do 34 divided by 68, which is 0 0.5. So it would be 0 0.5 hours. So that would be half an hour. So we will be at uh, Devley at 9.30. So that means we've got 15 minutes left. Okay, So we've got 15 minutes to travel the 16 miles. So this time we're looking for the speed. Okay, so it would be speed equals the distance, which is 16 miles, over time, which is 15 minutes, but we need that in hours, so that would be 0.25 hours. 
And so what we can do here is times top mod by 4 to get rid of the fraction. So it becomes uh, 64 over 1 or just 64 miles per hour. So the answer is 64 miles per hour. So we're asked to find angle BCE and that is going to be this one here because you start at B, go to C and then go to E and it's the angle you make. And I might just choose a different colour because we've already got red on here. So we're looking for this angle here. Now my advice for these kind of questions is always just try and work your way around the shape with angles you know. So for instance, I'm going to start with this angle here and we're going to call this angle A D C and we know that that must be 79 degrees and always write down the reason and we know it is because that is an isosceles triangle so if you look we've got an isosceles here this one this one and this one and the bottom two angles and I use the word bottom because I always imagine an isosceles as being this way up. The bottom two angles of an isosceles are always equal, so that must be 79. Now we've got two of the three um, angles in the triangle, and the last one is going to be angle DCA. And to work out what this angle is, we're going to take it away from 180. So we're going to do 180, take away the two 79s we've just worked out. And the reason for that is angles angles in a triangle equal 180 degrees. Okay, so when we do that, we do 180, take away the 158, and we're left with 22 degrees. So we know that this is going to be 22 degrees. And now we can actually work out angle BCE, because it's going to equal angle um, D C A and the reason for that is they are vertically opposite angles so that's just going to equal 22 degrees now it is really common for these types of question for you to get maybe one or even two marks for the answer but one or two marks normally for the reasons and for the explanations. In fact, I've seen quite a few um, exam questions where you get two marks for the reasons and only one mark for the answer. The important thing to realise in this question is that we know a female has been selected. So we can just basically get rid of all of this part of the uh, frequency tree because it's not relevant, because we know a female has been selected. So there's 29 females altogether and we're looking for the probability that the um, female chosen at random picked action. So it's just simply 16 over 29. Whenever we do these kind of questions, it's always best to convert the pattern into numbers. So we're just going to count the dots. So we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 9 in the first one. 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16, 17. So our sequence is going 9, 13, 17. And we're going to see what it's going up in. So we're adding 4 each time. And that means our sequence will involve 4n. And then what we do is we go backwards 1 to find the 0th term. So we're going to take away 1. So 9 take away 1 is 5. So the zeroth term is 5. And the zeroth term just tells us what to add on to the 4n. So 4n plus 5 will be our answer. So we're given 21 to 4 is the ratio. And we're just going to have our lines in. Because what we need to do is make the left hand side be 1. Okay. And to do that, for 21 I need to divide it by itself, divide it by 21, and we're going to do the same to the right hand side. So 21 divided by 21 is 1, perfect, that's what we wanted. 4 divided by 21 is 0 0.190 blah blah blah. It says it wants it to two decimal places, so it's going to be 1 to 0 0.19. The first thing we need to do is work out the area of the floor. 
and you'll notice that this is a trapezium. So with a trapezium, it, the formula is half a, B, uh, a plus B times H, and A and B are the parallel sides, so these ones are the parallel sides, and the height is the one connecting the two um, bases, the two parallel sides. So we're going to start off by writing down the formula, so it be half A plus B H, so half times uh, 2.8 plus 1.2 times 11. And when we do that, we get 22. So the area of the floor is 22 meters squared. And it says here that the tiles are sold in packs which cover 3 meters squared. So if each pack covers 3 meters squared, we're going to do 22 divided by 3 which will be 7.33 packs that we need. Now obviously you can't get a 0.3 of a pack or 0.33 of a pack. So we're gonna to have to get eight packs and just have some left over. So we'll need eight packs in total. Okay, next thing we um, look at is the fact that the uh, Jenny has a 25% discount. Um, so we need to find out what um, 25% discount would do to the £18.60 for the tiles or for the pack of tiles and so what we're going to do is we're going to get the £18.60 and we're going to times it by 0 0.75 so we're just going to find um, three quarters of it because she has a 25% discount and that would be 1395 so that's um, the uh, tiles are going to cost £13.95. Um, now I've done this in pence and I've kind of muddled it together here so really let's just go back because I've kind of done this in pence so that would be uh, 1860 times 0 0.75 and so each pack will cost 1395 and the reason we're doing this in pence is the answer needs to be given in pence uh, so I might as well just make that conversion now. And so it's going to be 8 lots of the 1,395 pence packs, which will cost in total 11,160 pence, or £111.60. But Jenny has £100 to spend, and we're asked how much extra does she need. So we're going to do the 1, 000, oh, 11,160 take away the 10,000 pence that she has which will give us 1,160 pence so she needs to find 11 pounds 60 or 1,160 pence from somewhere to find the density of this wooden block we're going to have to first of all find out what the volume of the block is and volume is the um, cross-sectional area times by the length um, and the reason why it's that is it's a prism and all prisms you just find the area of the cross section and we times it by the length so what is the shape of the cross section well the cross section is a triangle and the cross section is this part here I just quickly color it in and so we're just finding the area of that triangle so half base times height and we're going to times it by the length, and the length is how 3D the prism is. So the base is 3, the height is 14, and the length is 5. And when you do that, you get 105 centimeters cubed. Right, now we need to find out what the density is, and the formula for density is mass divided by volume. The mass is given to us in the question is 246. The volume we've just worked out whoops, is 105. And so you do 246 divided by 105, and you get 2.342 blah, blah, blah. And then we'd round that to two decimal places, which it says in the question to do, and that would be 
for grams per centimeters cubed. We can write the equation of any straight line as y equals mx plus c, m being the gradient and c being the y-intercept. Now the c, the y-intercept, is the easy one because it's just where the line crosses the y-axis. In this case, it's going to cross it at 2. Now to find the, uh, the gradient, we need to find two coordinates that we know and preferably next to each other. So I'm going to pick the same coordinate the y-intercept coordinate, and this coordinate here, we know what that is. And the definition of the gradient is for every one we go to the right, how far up we go. Or well, here we actually go down, so we're technically going minus 3 up. So the gradient is going to be minus 3 because it's gone down 3. So our equation is m equals minus 3x plus 2. To see if a number's in a sequence, we get the nth term and we get it equal to the number we think is in the sequence. And if the number is in the sequence, then we'll get a integer for n. If the number's not in the sequence, then we'll get a decimal. So we're just solving this now and we're doing 135 take away 24, which is 111. And then we're going to divide both sides by 10. And you're probably already seeing the fact that it doesn't work exactly because n is 11.1, .1, which means that um, pressure is wrong. 135 can't be in that sequence. So we need to first of all work out the amount of machine minutes it takes to make a toy. And what we do is we multiply the amount of machines by the amount of minutes. So 5 times 40, which would be 200. So if we had one machine, it would take 200 minutes to um, create one toy. Here we asked, well, okay, what if we wanted a, a toy every eight minutes? So we get the 200 and we divide it by eight. And when we do that, we get 25. So if we had 25 machines, we would be able to make it every eight minutes. And the logic here is five machines, so this is machines and this is minutes, is 40. Then, fifth, uh, then eight minutes, if you think about it, we divide that by five to get to eight. And so if we divide the amount of minutes by five, we actually times the amount of machines required by five. So this is called an inverse relationship. So if one doubles, the other halves. If one divided by five, the other will times by five. So our answer here is 25 machines. First thing we need to do is work out the volume of this uh, prism. And it's a trapezium-based prism. Uh, so the volume will be the area of the cross-section or area of the trapezium times the length, how 3D the um, prism is. So trapezium is half A plus B H and then times the length. Now A and B are the two parallel sides which will be this one and this one and then um, the H is the perpendicular line that, that hits both of them at 90 degrees, which is what perpendicular means, between the bases. So this will be the 25 meters here. So it's going to be half and then we're going to add 1 and 5 times that by 25. The length is how 3D it is, so it would be that 10 there. So we're going to times that by 10 and that will give us 750. So it's 750 meters cubed. Now um, there is a little formula we can make for the rate. So the rate of anything uh, for this will be um, the volume gained over time. Now with this question though we're interested in the time it will take. It says how long will it take. So we're actually looking at the time. So it will be time equals the volume which is 750 over the rate which is 15. So 750 divided by 15 is 50. 
so it will take 50 and let's have a look it says per minute so it would be 50 minutes y is inversely proportional to x means that y is proportional to 1 over x and I'm going to change that for an equal sign by timesing the right hand side by k and k represents our constant and we're told that when x is 5 y is 10.8 so I'm going to fill those in I'm going to substitute those in to be able to find out what k is going to be so it will be k over 5 and we're going to be solving this let's get my lines in and solve it I just times by the bottom of the fraction so times both sides by 5 and we're going to end up with 50.4 uh, is equal to k so k is 50.4 I'm going to rewrite this equation here but we know what k is it's 50.4 We're asked to find the value of x when y is 9. So we've got 9 equals 50.4 over x. And whenever in this situation here where we've got the unknown at the bottom of a fraction and we've got it equal to a number, what you can do here is actually just swap these around. We're t effectively, we're timesing both sides by x and dividing both sides by 9. But it does really help us out here because it just says that x is equal to 50.4 over 9. We can just do that on the calculator and it gives us 5.6. The arc is a section of the circumference and I'll show it on the diagram here. This is the arc. And to find the length of the arc we use uh, a simple formula and I'm just going to explain what the formula does. So the arc length is equal to the fraction of the circle that you've got and we times that by the circumference of the circle. Now to find the fraction of the circle we've got we work out the angle of the sector and we divide it by 360 because there are 360 degrees in a full circle times that by the circumference and circumference is just going to be pi times the diameter the angle is 61 degrees now the diameter if you imagine that the circle is all the way around so it's a full circle you can see the six centimeters here is the radius so if we carry that on there'll be another six centimeters here so the diameter will be 12 just two lots of the radius type that into a calculator and we get 6.387 blah 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 and it says it wants it to two decimal places so when we round that it comes to 6.39 so what I'm going to do is work out how I get from my center enlargement to each of the vertices on our shape and so I'm going to pick the bottom left one first. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six jumps to the left. Now with a scale factor of a third, instead of six jumps to the left, it's going to be a third of that for our new image. So instead of six to the left, it's only going to be two. So our new point will be here. And we're going to do the same to the top left one. This is going to take a bit of time, but that's fine. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So instead of 12 up, we're looking for our new one to be a third of that, which would be 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So it would be on the x-axis. And we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to the left. And again, instead of 6 to the left, it's going to be a third of that, which would be 2. So our new point will be here. And so if we draw in the new shape, let's make sure we try and do it as neat as possible, then it will be this bit here. And it says to label it B, so we'll put a B on it. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMath site, 
On Maths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing.